Okay. That sound all right? Okay. Can you hear? Okay. Okay, well, I, as I told Joe before, I'm not a, an expert on the CBI and I'm not a public speaker, so I'll just bear with me and I'll do the best I can. Uh, I enlisted November the 11th, 1942 in the Army Air Corps in Philadelphia at age 18. I was sent to Camp Mead, Merlin, for my processing and then to Atlantic City for basic training and then to New York to uh, Stewart Tech for aircraft engine school. And from there I went back to Atlantic City again for overseas training. The first airplane that I saw was the one they put me on in June of 1943. I spent 27 months in the CBI in the Air Transport Command as a flight engineer and ground crew chief on C-47, C-46, B-24, and an A-26. I spent my 19th and 20th birthdays in India and I got home three days before my 21st and I was discharged November the 10th, 1945 in Richmond, Virginia with the rank of Staff Sergeant. So that's enough of that. Okay. China, Burma, India, or CBI as we refer to it, is called the Forgotten Theater of War. We were a small group of men and women who served there between January of 1942 and March of 1944, or 46. It was the longest military combat action of the Second World War, with some of the bloodiest battles fought in Burma. We were a small little known group, with operation always at the end of the supply line, short on personnel, and still managed with the help of our allies to keep several million Japanese from uh, entering uh, India and uh, keeping them uh, in China and preventing them from uh, either getting it to Pacific or uh, Europe. And like I say, the main purpose was to keep China in the war and prevent the Japanese from entering or invading India. The personnel lived under the most hazardous and adverse conditions, having not only the enemy to contend with, but also the climatic elements, disease, such as malaria, dysentery, and some diseases we never heard of before. Uh, they also were the leeches that dropped from the trees, that were in the bushes, lived in the bushes, and also the ones that lived on the ground. Also the monsoons, the terrific heat and humidity. One note I'd like to make here is there were 350,000 U.S. personnel in the CBI during the Second World War. And of the 75,000 people, or MIAs, in the Second World War, over 20,000 were MIAs in the CBI. So that's a pretty, we had about a third of the MIAs come out of CBI. <clears throat> and when I mentioned uh, 350,000, that was through rotation. So we didn't have that many there all at one time. Some of the better known forces that served there were Merle's Marauders who started out with 3,000 men and lost over three quarters of them. I, the stories that they came out of Burma with about two to 300 men out of the 3,000. They were either killed, wounded, or they suffered from the diseases that were going around in that area at that time. There was also the 10th and the 20th Air Force. The Flying Tigers who were later assigned to the 14th Air Force and the Air, For the Airport, the Air Transport Command to flew supplies and personnel over the Himalayan mountains, commonly called the hump. Where the weather conditions and Japanese fighters brought them down. One of the passages over the hump was called Aluminum Alley. And because, because, of, <clears throat> because about 900 planes lay on the floor of that alley. Now, I just found out tonight there, there were over 6,000 airmen that lost their lives in the CBI alone. Uh, in 1942, all the ports of China and Indochina were held by the Japanese. And with no way to supply troops in the 14th Air Force, so the Air Transport Command was formed. It consisted of 100 officers and 1,000 enlisted men, plus 27 C-47 aircraft, all secondhand from the airlines. The goal was 10,000 tons 
over the hump by Christmas of 1943. By the end of the war, it had grown to 35,000 officers and men and carried over 80,000 tons a month. The Burma route at its best carried 15,000 tons. Now, the route that was by, uh, by air started out from Miami, went to uh, Puerto Rico, and then down through South America to Brazil to uh, Natal, across Natal to the Ascension Islands. Now, the Ascension Islands are just a little dot in the ocean. And they had a short runway, and when we took off from that runway, went out over the cliff, because you didn't have enough airspeed, and the plane went down like that to gather enough to take off. And I guess 1978, I was at a national convention, and there were people there that I had never met before, and we were talking about the Ascension Islands and that airstrip, and the fellow done the same thing I did when I made that motion. And one of the wives said, well, I guess they're telling the truth because they both made the same motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So from there, we went to, uh, you stopped at uh, <clears throat> Accra, Africa, which was the Gold Coast, and then on through uh, Africa and Egypt to Aden, Arabia. That has a different name today. I don't know what it is. They've changed even uh, when I was there. It was Ceylon, now it's Sri Lanka. Uh, and then from there to Karachi, and then through India to the different bases up in uh, the SM Valley. There was Chabwa, uh, Terespur, uh, Laminar Hat, and those were bases that the planes took off to fly to hunt. And then, uh, by sea, they, the personnel and supplies landed at a port in Bombay, and they were sent by plane or train to their destinations. <clears throat> the Burma Road was an engineering feat of its own. It was being, while it was being built, there was fighting going all around it, and those, those fellows had a tough time up there. They had everything to contend with. Uh, also, there were railroad battalions that had to contend with the different gauges of track. That's the widths of the track. And uh, one, <laughs> and the strange part of this is that some of the rails that were used there were torn up from a defunct railroad in Phoenix, Arizona. There were pipe battalions and mule skinners because mules were used to carry supplies in Burma. And then there were the Gurkhas. And uh, the Gurkhas, they were the f most fierce and, and feared fighters, and they carried this knife. I, I kept this here because it's kind of dangerous. But they carried this knife, and they never drew this unless they were going to draw blood. So if a Gurkha would happen to show it to us at any time, he'd stick it in his finger, and he'd draw a little blood. And can you imagine a brigade of these guys coming at you with this knife wielding in the air? <clears throat> okay. Oh, yeah. And the CBI patch. We all wore this on our left sleeve. And that was uh, designed by order of uh, General Stilwell to his adjutant to design it an insignia to be worn by all U.S. personnel to show the difference between U.S. and British troops because their uniforms were so close in appearance to ours. The, M the MPs had trouble telling the difference when there was a fracas between the two. And I can't neglect to mention the nurses that served there. <clears throat> they were dedicated and hardworking and understaffed. In the hospital I was in at New Malair, India, at night from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m. in the morning, one nurse and one orderly handled three wards with 80 patients in them, and these words were dispersed. No, they weren't close together. They were spread apart. At the time they were built, I guess they figured if there was any kind of an error rate, they wouldn't take out the whole hospital at one time. And all night long, they took care of giving the medicine to the people that, that were scheduled. The first B-29 raids on Japan started from Karagpur, India, and refueled at a base in China. When the first B-29s landed to Karachi, India, <clears throat> no one was allowed near the planes without a pass. Now, they had mechanical problems, and the, the uh, maintenance personnel were not allowed to cross the line that was uh, being patrolled 
by the Indian guards without the pass. But Tokyo Rose knew all the serial numbers of these planes and their mechanical problems, and she announced it on the radio that we all knew. Uh, we would listen to her when we were flying, and she played the music of our time, and we didn't pay much attention to the propaganda. Although at one point she knew more about our bases than we did. When I speak of stories of supplies, in our group we had 28 planes on our base when I first arrived with only three planes flying. The rest were what we called a boneyard, and they were lined up in scavenge for parts. They had been condemned from the hump, and we sent men to all parts of the theater to beg, borrow, even steal parts. We used reconditioned spark plugs and parts, and plus uh, whatever we could repair in time we had them all flying. Now, one thing about that, in February of 44, our base, our commander wanted each plane to fly a minimum of 300 hours a month. Uh, that was quite a feat. And the top plane at that particular time flew 360 hours, which is 12 hours a day, a little better than 12 hours a day flight time. And the airlines at that particular time, with all the pr proper maintenance and the equipment, strove for 10 hours a day. And the plane that I, we crewed had 340 hours, and the plane that was number three had 320 hours, but all the planes on the base had 300 plus hours, which was quite a feat for what we had when we first started with that base. And then there was something, they, they took me somewhere in the desert and a plane with a GI was waiting. He told me the plane needed a spark plug change and the points needed on the magnetos had to be set. I said I could do that, but I didn't know how to get the cowling off. And he said he didn't know how to do the plugs or the magnetos because when I went to school in New York, all the aircraft engines that I worked on were on, on stands. So it wasn't on a plane. It didn't have cowling on it, so I had no idea how to take the cowling off a plane. So. I said that I could change the plugs and set the points, and he said he could take the cowling off. So between the two of us, we got the job done, and I guess you'd call that good old Yankee ingenuity. <laughs> <laughs> then the inspector general, when he came to inspect the operation, found men that had no matching uniforms, pants legs cut short, arms cut out of the shirts, no hats, and poor military discipline. And his remarks were the worst soldiers he ever saw in the world. He said, but they're the best damn mechanics in the world also. <laughs> Some things that were done to keep these planes wouldn't be approved today. Keep these planes in the air, they, it wouldn't be approved today. We had a C-47 that was known as a DC-2. The forerunner of that was a DC, uh, uh, well, known as a DC-3. And the forerunner of that was a DC-2, which was a little smaller plane. Uh, the wing on the DC-3 was unrepairable, but we found that a, a wing on a DC-2 would fit on a DC-3. So the wing was replaced on a DC-3 with a DC-2 wing. This plane flew for quite a few weeks until it was discovered that that wing was two inches shorter than the original wing. So they, they grounded the plane. <laughs> yeah. Then. <laughs> These planes were old and the metal started to show cracks from fatigue. We would drill holes at both ends of the split and this was called stop drilling and would keep the split from going any further. And my plane had quite a few of them. And another thing that we did, we, we had a problem with a C-46 brake drum and we had no parts, but we found that it was interchangeable with a B-17. So, they happened to have a B-17 brake drum, and when we put it, we put the brake drum on the wheel, and there was about that much of the pads that were showing. Well, the brakes worked, so we released the plane to fly. That plane must have flown two months when somebody spotted that the brake drum didn't fit, and they said the plane can't fly that way, and they grounded it, and it sat that way for two or three months till we got apart. <laughs> okay. The Air Transport Command flew around the clock, regardless of weather during the monsoons from June to October. It was so humid, closed in dry, and mildew was a problem.
It was just one time that I remember that we didn't fly and planes didn't come in or out of the base at that particular time. The entire base was flooded. <clears throat> the runways had walls of water on them and you couldn't get, you couldn't get off or, or, or land, but one B-29 pilot said he could get his plane off. Well, he got screaming down the runway, hit a wall of water, and brought the plane to a screeching halt. And it's a good thing there was a nose wheel on that or he'd have flipped it right over. Uh, some very decisive battles were fought in, in, uh, in Burma, and one was the Battle of Mishinaw, Burma. Uh, we held one end of the field and the Japs held the other. Uh, the base and the town changed hands several times before the battle was decided. The marauders who had participated in many fights in Burma were a major part of this campaign. By the time they were, by this time they were pretty well worn out. Then there was the Battle of Kahima on the border of India and Burma with some of the bloodiest fighting of the Second World War. It consisted mainly of Canadian and British troops and lasted from March 44 till June of 44. The defense of Kohima Ridge was called the Stalingrad of Burma. It was overshadowed by the Allied landing in Normandy. Some funny things that happened there, you know, GIs are always trying to drum up some kind of agitation for somebody. Uh, we had the Indian merchants on their carts drawn by camels. And when they leave their village early in the morning, they, most of them would sleep on the, on the way into town uh, because the camels knew the direct route into the town and back to the village. So the GIs got the bright idea of turning these camels around and when, when these guys woke up, they, they were back in the village and they couldn't figure out how that happened. <laughs> so th this went on for, for quite a while and one of the Indians faked being asleep and caught the GIs in the act. <laughs> a notion was posted on the board that anybody caught doing this would be court-martialed, so that ended that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when my, when, this was one of my experiences. On my only trip to the rest camp in 1945, the camp was 7,000 feet up in the mountains. Uh, we, we were taken up in uh, weapons carriers by GI drivers, but they had a civilian bus that would take, take us on a pass. Like the, the one town was Raw Pindi, and I went down there once or twice, and uh, they, this bus had, on the top of it was a, a boy that sat up there with a rock with a rope tied around it, and he was called a rock walla. And these were hairpin turns going up through this mountain. And when the bus driver couldn't get into gear or downshift, and the bus would start to roll backwards, the kid would drop the rock down. This is the truth, and it was supposed to stop under the wheel and stop the bus. Well, this particular night when we were coming back up the mountains, the driver couldn't get the thing in gear and we started rolling back and the kid dropped the rock and went right over the rock. He jumped off the bus and I don't know what he threw under there, but all of a sudden that bus stopped with a jerk. Now, this particular bus had all bench seats. The first guy in it climbed over until he got in the back. Well, when this was going on, we had fellows bailing out the windows. And the ones that were left, when that bus stopped, it just broke the backs of those seats and they all wound up on the back of us. And when I got out of that bus, I swear, the back end was that far over the cliff. That kid saved our lives. Uh, and then there was uh, Photo Joe. He was a Jap pilot who'd fly over the base and take pictures and, and by radio he'd harass the base. He was at an altitude that was hard for the P-40s to attain. One of the pilots had a P-40 stripped down, and one day he waited for Photo Joe to shoot him and shot him down. The Japanese responded the next day with a devastating air raid. <clears throat> Another time, a few men loaded bombs on a C-47 and pushed them off the plane and bombed the Jap headquarters. It was an unscheduled bombing, and they were almost court martial so I'm not sure anymore whether they were or not. And then dropping supplies was done 
by two natives tied by a rope to keep them from falling out of the plane, and one enlisted man with a parachute. One day, one of the native men was bounced out of the plane by an air pocket, and some of these air pockets were a thousand feet or more when it dropped down. Uh, the pilot and the rest of the crew, they were at a loss how to get this guy back in, and believe it or not, the plane hit another air pocket, and he flew back in the plane. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and this is, <laughs> and this is documented, uh, uh, documented in a book on the CBI, and I knew the pilot, his name was Jim Rice. Uh, some of the prominent people that served there, of course, was uh, General Joe Stilwell, General Claire Chenault, General Casey Vincent, General Robert Scott, I think at that time he was a colonel. He was the author of God is My Co-Pilot. And one of his crew was a fellow named George Motley, and he was my uh, line chief when I first got overseas. <clears throat> there was uh, Jackie Coogan, was a glider pilot. I think a lot of you remember Jackie Coogan. Um, colonel Philip Cochran, he was Colonel Flip Corkin in Terry and the Pirates. There was Lord Lewis Mountbatten, who was the Allied Supreme Commander, Captain Melvin Douglas, the actor, Pappy Boink, it was made famous by the TV show Black, Squeech, uh, Black Sheep Squadron. And then there was Tom Harmon, all-American football player from Michigan. He flew, uh, I think, a P-38. And then there was Hank Greenberg, the ball player. Uh, I think you've all heard of the John Birch Society. Well, John Birch was CBI, and he was mysteriously killed. And then the, I mentioned before General Casey Vincent. I, I want to make a little remark about him. Uh, Casey, Clinton D. Casey Vincent was the youngest general at age 29 in a World War II fighter ace, and East China commander of Chenault's Flying Tigers 14th Air Force. He was the real life model for Milton Caniff's Colonel Vincent Casey the comic strip, uh, and, and the Terry and the Pirates, and also Steve Canyon's General Shantytown. Casey Vincent died at age 40 in his sleep. I guess because there wasn't, <coughs> I guess because the theater wasn't well known, and because of the unfavorable conditions, not too many entertainers or U.S. troops got that far. Some who did were Joey Brown, Jinx Falkenberg, Ann Sheridan, Ben Blue, and Paulette Goddard. I'm sure I've left out a few, but those are the ones that came to my mind. Uh, the China Burma India Veterans Association is the only theater of operation to have their own group or organization, and that's our insignia there in China Burma India and World War II. And that we have white hats with the M1, and uh, it, it, they're pretty nice. And we it isn't anything political, it's a social, social gathering. Uh, after the war, I had little to say about CBI or, or even the war as far as that went. And few people knew or even seemed to care. Strangely, I worked side by side with a man for at least 10 years who served there. Neither one of us knew it until we happened to meet years later after both of us leaving that particular uh, employment. Uh, recently, I was in the stands at the Warminster Memorial Day service, and sitting next to me was a VFW commander. I had my white hat and my red jacket with the China, Burma, and India printed on them, and a big CBI patch on the back, and he asked me what war that was. <laughs> <laughs> like I said before, I'm not an expert on the topic of China, Burma, and India theater, but my purpose is to tell people that we were there and how important it was. There are subjects on the Burma Road, Stillwell, the Hump Pilots, Merle's Marauders, and others that can be found in publications. I just try to point out a few instances and give credit to the men and women who served there. And I have a poem here that pretty much sums up the whole thing. Uh, some were sent by troop ships, others went by air. It was still the CBI no matter however you got there. They told us that our rations would suit us to a TIG. 
Most of what they served us was labeled KRC. China had a crisis, they needed air supply. The route was over a mountain, was higher than we could fly. We live in huts called fashions. We didn't mind dirt floors, but in the rain they leaked so bad you floated out the doors. Some went to Lido to build a road with pick. We built it over a hill so steep the mountain goats got sick. Supplies were often sent by air, ammo, food, and more. And if there was no landing strip, we pushed it out the door. We saw elephants, monkeys, tigers, cobras, and the rest. It was leeches and mosquitoes. That seemed to like us best. <laughs> the war is now long over and memories grow dim. But remember friends we lost like Tex and John and Slim. They now call us veterans, but as the years go by, we still remember the job we did in the hell called CBI. And in closing, I, I would like to, I always uh, close my little talk with a prayer, and it, it was written by the British and Canadian soldiers after the Battle of Kahima, and it's inscribed and, and carved on the monument at the site of that battle. It goes this way. When you go home, tell them, of, tell them of us and say for your tomorrow, we gave our today. So if, are there any questions? It, yeah. Most people uh, relate CBI with the Flying Tigers. Did you have much to do with them? No, well, you know, the Flying Tigers was a voluntary group. They were there about a year before the theater was opened up. And when the Army got in there, because it was Army Air Force then, uh, some of them were, they, they had an opportunity to either join the 14th Air Force or leave the or leave and come back to the States. No, I didn't have much to do with them, no. No, I, what we did, what, the kind of flying that, that I did was called low level flying. We just flew from Karachi up to Burma. We went, uh, flew all the bases to the base of the hump. We, we, there were names Karagpur, not Karagpur, well, we flew into Karagpur, but there was Andal, there was Lamnerhat, Tezpur, uh, Barakpur. These were jump off points for the planes that go over the hump. Uh, I did what I was supposed to do. Uh, I only volunteered once and I was turned down, so. <laughs> do you know how they got the name of the Flying Tigers? No, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure, but they painted that on their nose. Now, one thing that I do know was they changed the color of the, the uh, nose cones. They paint them different colors. They also changed the numbers on the planes. And the Japanese thought they had more planes than they did because of the different numbers and the different colored nose cones. I, I know that much. <laughs> well, I, and uh, let's see, that's, I, I, that, that's what, and I know that uh, Chiang Kai-shek and, and Stillwell didn't get along, and Stillwell didn't get along too well with or um, Chenault didn't get along too well with Stillwell, and Stillwell didn't get along with Chiang Kai-shek. I think he called him Peanut. And uh, when Wendell Wilkie came over there on a goodwill tour, right after he was over, I think that's when Stillwell was relieved of his duty there. Yeah? Do you have a directory of uh, the uh, people that were in the campaign? Is there a directory available? Of oh, people that were? Personnel? Uh, uh, that were there? Yeah, only, only the ones that belong to our organization. I think there's about 7,000. Is that right, Bob? Eight. Eight, okay. Yeah. So why was there such a large number of MIA from the area? <sighs> well, I, I think because of the weather conditions. And I guess, you know, we had a problem, the C-46 for one, was released before it was proven. And I know they had a lot of problems with them in the beginning. And it was treacherous flying. When, you, <clears throat> when, when, when they flew those passages through the hump, they had all kind of weather. It could be beautifully sunny when they took off and the weather conditions that they hit storms and rain and, and tremendous winds, it just brought those planes down. Plus the Japanese shot a few of them down too. They were, they were unarmed passenger planes what they were, a C-47 was just a, a cargo and passenger. Uh, I, I carried a 45, some of the crew carried 
uh, carbines because we flew into places where the Japanese were uh, close by. But uh, that's the only reason I, I, can, I can give you. There was, there was a lot. Yeah. Are these Gurkhas yeah. Buddhists or Hindus? No, no. No, they're a tribe all their own. They live in their own camp, their own villages. But do they have a religion? Do they, do they have their own religion? Or they yeah, I would say so, yeah. Because uh, this knife, when I was at the rest camp, we went to uh, a Gurkha camp. And of course, we couldn't get a, a, a Gurkha knife off of the Gurkhas, but they said that they were running a, a, a group through for some of the men. And we ordered them, and I think I paid three or four dollars for that at that time. But that was made right in the Gurkha camp. But yeah, they are, and, and you know, you see one, you've seen them all because they're about this size and they're chunky, and they walk from their village to the camp, and it might take them 30 days to go each way when they have their uh, leave of absence or whatever. Yeah, they're, and they're, they're, they're really competitive. In fact, they wouldn't go into battle unless there was a British officer right up front with them because uh, years before the British officer would stay in the back and let them go. So they, <laughs> they got smart later on. Yeah. They were part of the British Army. Yes. I, I, Army. Yeah, right. They were part of the British Army. That's correct. Not only that, uh, going up, you had a place there. Uh, it was a hospital in Michigan, which was a uh, staff fight for the doctors for the University of Michigan Hospital. Oh. General. Yeah. That was the 20th General Hospital. Uh, 20th General Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just, uh, yeah. When these cargo planes flew over the hump, were they on their own most of the time or did they generally have some fighter escorts? No, I think they flew, uh, they, they flew unescorted. And yeah, they didn't fly over the C-47 and the C-46 through, flew through the passages. The C-54 and the B-24 and the XC-109, they, they, they stood a little better chance because they attained a higher altitude. Some of those planes have gunners on them. Uh, you know what? We, I, I, I can't say anything about that. Only uh, we were, I, I was assigned to the detached to the first troop carrier command, and we were to supply supplies into Burma, and the Japanese were, they would shoot at the plane on the approach. And so we had an idea, a mountain of 50 caliber, where the escape hatch was on bungee cord. And we thought better of it because we figured the first thing we'd do would be shoot the wing off, so we didn't bother with that. But I, I, I can't tell. Uh, during the Vietnam War, they made gunships out of the C 47s, I know that. And there's quite a few of those C 47s still flying, too. They were a real workhorse. I, we used to say, little chewing gum and, and safety wire, and they fly. Uh, yeah? Did you uh, participate in uh, resupplying uh, Maryland's Marauders? No, I didn't particularly, no. No, no I, I would have probably flown the supplies up to Burma, but no. We had a group of our men that went in there. How I got into the first troop carrier command, the first three planes that landed at our base were the first three planes that were transferred out, and that's the way they worked it. First available planes that somebody needed, they went out. But we always came back to our base when, when the project or whatever it was was over. Yeah. Well, I, I like all, there's a few fellows that served in the CBI and they're here tonight, and I'd like them to stand up because they, they deserve, that's why I'm here. Bring them up. Yeah. Well, I, I guess that's about it. <coughs> that about Pardon? You talked about K-Rax and C-Rax. Yeah. What do you do for water in a place like that? Well, they had Lister bags, oh, okay. yeah, and uh, they did have they did have running water where I was. By the time the water got there, it was dried up. 
Yeah. But uh, yeah, we, we had the list of bags, yeah. And that, you know, you, that didn't taste too well. <laughs> and you couldn't put ice in, in tea at the particular time I got there because the water was contaminated and the ice was made from that water. And another thing, laundry. They sent it out to an Indian laundry and they beat it against a rock. That's how they cleaned the laundry, yeah. And they done it sometimes the water was contaminated, you get your clothes back and oh, they had an awful odor. But you had to wear them, didn't have any choice. And one of my uniforms was beaten so bad it was white. Yeah. That may sound like a silly question, but I was always available to either water off of a ship or our, our desalination plants. I've never been in a condition where one of those two sources weren't available. Yeah, well, they did have a water tank. And it started out with a, a, a large pipe, and then as it went further down the base, the pipe got smaller and smaller. And we did, for a while, go without any kind of water to wash. Uh, <laughs> I learned, after a while, just to wash one part at a time, because I used to get in there and get all showered up and the water go off. And boy, there's nothing worse than dried up soap. <laughs> Uh, but we were, you know, our base was quite a distance away. We flew across any. In fact, uh, the f I have the time and hours from Miami to Shabra, India, and I have 83 hours. I know the fellows went on a boat were under a lot longer than 83 hours. <laughs> so I guess that I guess that takes care of that. Okay. Yeah. I hope I said it enough. Thank you.